This program is brought to you by Stanford on iTunes U at Stanford University. Please visit us at itunes.stanford.edu. I hope to share with you uh, what we've learned uh, over the past surprisingly long period of time uh, that I've been here at Stanford on how stress and support uh, affect cancer patients. Um, and it's an area that's been of some interest to the public. This is from uh, Tuesday's Wall Street Journal. Uh, and um, there has been considerable interest over many years in how stress and support um, affect cancer, both the way people live with cancer, but also the progression of cancer in this article by Amy Marcus um, in particular was looking at some recent a recent study that uh, came out of Australia indicating that hopefulness does not have much of an effect on um, the progression of lung cancer. Now I personally considered that study a rather hopeless uh, study in that the measures of hopefulness weren't very good um, and they were studying people with lung cancer which is as you know is a very rapidly progressing cancer, so there isn't a whole lot of time for psychosocial factors to get enough traction to have an effect on disease um, progression anyway. Plus, it's also an illness that is complicated by the fact that in the majority of cases, smoking is a leading cause of the disease. So many of the people who have lung cancer have a rather unusual psychological burden of feeling particularly guilty for having given themselves the disease through the habit of smoking. So it was, it was a study that got a lot of attention because it tended to uh, indicate a lack of connection between a psychosocial variable hopefulness and disease progression. Uh, I understand why people are concerned about this, and many of you may be here because you wonder, um, is, uh, you know, is it an attitude that gives you cancer? Is it an attitude that controls cancer? And there's been a lot in the popular press suggesting that if you just have the right attitude, you'll do fine. Um, that uh, uh, you can you get cancer because you have some psychological need for it, which is not true, uh, or that you can control cancer by just being upbeat and hopeful. And if you just you know get it fixed in your head that, gosh, you know if I just won't let this thing get to me, somehow the cancer won't kill me, and that that's a fine idea. But somebody hasn't told people's bodies about it because cancer is not simply a hope deficit disease or you don't get it because you had some unmet psychological need. We get it because we're biological beings. Now that said, there may be factors in the way you cope with it that may have an effect on the disease or its treatment. Um, but uh, it's not simply a matter of fixing it in your head so you can let your body take care of itself. It just doesn't work that way. It's more complicated. So, uh, and in fact, one of the original studies in this area that I get the most pleasure out of was published in, in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1979 by Len Derogatis, and they looked at metastatic breast cancer patients who lived more than a year versus those who didn't. And the major distinction was that the ones who lived more than a year were rated as more unpleasant and uncooperative by their doctors. <laughs> now. Uh, I'm not sure that they actually lived longer. It may just be that it seemed that they lived longer. <laughs> um, but it actually does suggest something about what we found in many decades of research with cancer patients, that it isn't blind optimism. It's realistic optimism. It's living your life fully, and it's taking hold of your life and living it the way you want to live it, which sometimes means being unpleasant and uncooperative. But taking charge of your treatment in your life is what seems to be the kind of attitude that helps. It isn't pie-in-the-sky optimism. So uh, what I'd like to do is review with you um, factors that relate to stress, the stress of having cancer, and how one copes with it. In particular, the model of uh, stress as a way of understanding what happens to people who get cancer. 
uh, depression, another kind of uh, maladaptive response to cancer and its relationship to cancer. What we do in uh, supportive expressive groups to try and help people cope better with cancer, a uh, relationship between stress and survival, and some ideas about physiological mechanisms that may link uh, uh, the way people handle stress to cancer progression, so how feeling may be related to healing. And if there are, by the way, questions along the way, feel free to ask them, but I'll leave plenty of time at the end for uh, discussion as well. We all handle stress differently. Uh, I think this was a freeway in Southern California. <laughs> And I have a suspicion that it may have been put up after the last gubernatorial election. I'm not sure, but in any event, um, we all handle stressors in different ways. Um, in fact, uh, many people, uh, many of my cancer patients think that uh, the rest of the world kind of came around to understanding what it was like to have cancer. On September 12th in our group, one of the patients said, welcome to my world. You know, my body felt attacked the way we all felt attacked uh, on 9-11. Uh, in a sense, people with cancer feel attacked. They feel that, you know, one minute everything is safe and fine, and the next minute their bodies are attacked by the disease. So understanding something about the frame of mind of people who uh, experience uh, terrifying situations like 9-11 also teaches us something about what cancer patients have to live with uh, with their disease. And you can think of the reaction to these terrifying events as affecting three domains of function, emotion, cognition, and social contact. And cancer has the potential to adversely affect all three of those important domains of human functioning. Uh, this, I, I particularly love this picture. It was two women who were witnessing 9-11. And I don't even know if they knew each other before it happened. But it's a reminder to us that the way in which we process these domains of emotion and cognition involves our social functioning. The social connection you have at the time you're having these other experiences can have a powerful impact on how you adjust to the illness uh, and its treatment or to the terror that you're experiencing. Um, we did a study um, of responses to 9-11. We posted a complex survey on the internet on September 28th of 2001 we managed to enroll 7,500 people from around the world, actually, from all 50 states and 39 countries who were willing to sit down, take some time, and tell us how they were reacting to 9-11. We were able to get almost 4,000 six-month follow-ups, which was quite uh, surprising to us. And interestingly, um, many people reported, we viewed this simply as a survey. We were just trying to understand how people reacted. But many people found filling out the questionnaire is actually therapeutic, much to my surprise. It hell, it said it gave me some time to just put aside everything else that was troubling me and sit down and think about how I was reacting. They actually found the Likert scales. The Likert scales, the scale, you know, rate how anxious or sad or whatever you are on a scale from one to five. Just asking people to rate how they're doing in response to uh, uh, a stressful event can, in and of itself, be helpful to some people. Uh, and it's a way of reminding us that just being in tune with people's emotional reactions to cancer uh, can in and of itself have a therapeutic potential. Uh, we actually found um, that the kinds of things that as clinicians we believe for a long time held true in understanding how people were reacting to the 9-11 attacks. We found that people who engaged in what we call avoidance coping who did things to distract themselves or not deal with it, for example, substance use uh, or behavioral disengagement, I just don't want to deal with it, think about it, uh, who engaged in denial, pretended it didn't happen, uh, were all doing worse at six-month follow-up. They were more distressed and had a lesser sense of well-being. Interestingly, those who engaged in self-blame, who found something to blame themselves, in regard to the 9-11 attacks, wound up more distressed and had less well-being. We found in general, and this is one of the, I think, dangers for people uh, with cancer, we tend to blame the, ourselves for events over which we had little or no control. You see that in trauma victims all the time. Rape victims will say, I should have known better than to walk to the drugstore at 4 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon, like somehow they should have known an assailant was hanging out. Because in general, we'd rather feel guilty than helpless. Um, helplessness is very difficult to bear, the contingency of life, the idea that it's just bad luck that you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
And so people would rather write a story that puts them as the author of the events, even if it makes them feel guilty. In general, one of the reasons that I think many cancer patients are so vulnerable to mistaken notions that positive thinking will get you out of cancer or that uh, some unconscious psychological need gave you cancer uh, is because they'd like to have some fantasy of being in control when certain aspects of cancer are things that we just don't control. Uh, except through medical treatment and through handling stress better, but we don't directly control it by introspecting on how we needed it. But I think people are vulnerable to that because they want to feel in control even when they're not. So we found that the things that were related to how distressed people were after 9-11 included the things I've already talked about, the uh, false self-blame, uh, denial, avoidance. Um, also, emotional control. People who try to control their emotions tended to be more distressed rather than less. And the issue there is people think, if I don't get too upset about it, then maybe it's not so bad. Or maybe controlling my emotions is a way of controlling the cancer. One patient started to cry, and her husband said, don't cry, you'll make the cancer spread. Uh, not a good thing. Um, and in fact, uh, what we find is that people who give vent to all of their feelings around cancer actually do better, not worse. And I'm going to show you some evidence about that. So basically, the way you coped with an acute stressor like 9-11 predicted a lot about how well you were feeling six months later. And we think those same lessons apply to cancer. What have we learned? That you can get into a vicious cycle of denial, disengagement, suppressing emotions, abusing substances. Uh, self-blame, looking backward rather than forward, rather than changing your life. You know, many of my cancer patients say to me, my life has not been the same since I got cancer, but in many ways it's better. And so it's not a, you know, you start out wanting your life to be the way it was the week before it all happened. It's not going to be that way. But you can use it as an occasion to redefine your priorities in life, to change your lives in many ways, and it can be better. It's just going to be different. Um, and the issues of emotional support, that people who don't deal with it tend not to make the most of the social network that they have around them. Now, you'll lose some people. Some people just won't get it and won't be able to help. But you can intensify and deepen relationships as well. So the lessons we learned from 9-11 before turning more directly to cancer are that traumatic stresses are best handled by facing rather than fleeing the stressor itself, by expressing rather than suppressing emotions that come up because of these stressors, finding social support rather than remaining isolated, restructuring your meaning in life. And in this sense, feeling may lead to healing, and I'm going to try and show you that now uh, in the context of cancer. We can think of cancer as a series of stressors. Uh, the existential issues, you know, everybody who's diagnosed with cancer thinks they're going to die of it, even though half of all people diagnosed with cancer will live to die of something else. It's the first thing on everybody's mind. So you have to deal with the existential concerns, even if uh, the illness itself is not uh, an existential threat. And what we've succeeded in doing in many cases is converting cancer from a terminal illness to a chronic illness. So for some, some people are just plain cured, that's great. For many people, they have to live with it the rest of their lives. And they can live fairly full and productive lives, but they've got the constant issue and threat of cancer with them. And some will die fairly quickly, but the existential issues are, array, are aroused for everybody. Um, they have reminders of the illness in the form of pain, uh, fears, treatment decisions, side effects of treatments, which can be uh, very difficult. And one of the nasty tricks that's played on, on oncologists, I'm a psychiatrist, I have the greatest respect for oncologists, they have a very tough job because uh, unlike cardiology where you instantly love your doctor, you know, you come into our emergency room here with crushing substernal chest pain, and five minutes later, you're not dead and the pain is gone. You love your cardiologist. The opposite is the case with cancer patients. You come in with a little bleeding or a lump, an abnormal lab test, and the doctor's words transform that into a life threat. And the treatment in the early part of cancer is much worse than the disease. You know, you, it's slash, poison, and burn, as Dr. Susan Love says. And the treatment makes you feel sick, not the illness. So all of the reinforcements are negative. You know, you don't want to tell your doctor anything because you know what happened the last time you told him or her something. Uh, so it's a complex biomedical interaction, too, because of the nature of cancer and its treatment. Um, you have reduced physical abilities. You have changes in body image. Your social environment is different. I asked the medical students here, think about what it would be like to have cancer. 
uh, to, be the, to play the life of a cancer patient, even if you didn't have cancer. So you'll spend a month going from one waiting room to another, reading stale magazines, cut off from the people who know you and like you, not doing things that make you feel productive and valued. Um, it's a tough life, even if you're not sick. And on top of that, of course, people are sick. So your whole social environment changes. So there are a whole array of stressors that come with having cancer. We find, in fact, that a substantial minority of cancer patients have the same kind of emotional reactions to cancer that we see in people who um, uh, have gone through automobile accidents, sexual assault, other kinds of assaults, what's called post-traumatic stress disorder, where they have intrusive thoughts. They can't stop thinking about it. They have nightmares. They have flashbacks to the day they were diagnosed. Uh, they find themselves unable to enjoy things they used to enjoy, trying to avoid thinking about the cancer or its treatment. They find themselves irritable overreacting to minor stimuli. Uh, those are all symptoms that you see in combat vets with PTSD or in rape victims. We see in a substantial number of people, for example, with metastatic breast cancer as well. And in fact, we found in recent studies that about a third of our uh, patients with metastatic breast cancer have the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So this stress model is becoming a more salient way of understanding how it is that cancer patients live with their illness and what we can do to help them. There is, in fact, evidence that life stressors um, can, in fact, contribute to cancer risk. Now, again, this isn't some unmet psychological need. This is a recently published study uh, in Scandinavia in which they looked at the risk. This is a large population, about 10,000 people. Uh, the risk of getting breast cancer if you had had one of these adverse events uh, a major life event such as divorce, separate, separation, death of a husband, death of a close relative or friend. And these are what are called hazard ratios. So what it means is basically one means there's no increase in risk. So anything above one indicates an increase in risk. And these 95% confident intervals simply mean that if the lower bound is, above, is one or above, the risk is statistically significantly elevated. So what this says is that any single adverse life event gives you a 7% increase in getting breast cancer. Multiple, a major event, not just a, a minor one, gives you about a 35% increase. Divorce or separation, a two-fold increase. Death of a husband, a two-fold increase. So ha experiencing a stressful life event may increase your risk of getting an illness like breast cancer. Now, not all studies show this. Some do, some don't. None of them show that stress is protective. So it isn't a good thing. Now, we can't go around preventing these kinds of tragic events in our lives. But it's worth being aware that our body absorbs the consequences of stressors. And when you lose a loved one, all kinds of things happen. You know, your life is disrupted. You're grieving. You're sad. Uh, you're probably not eating as well. You're not sleeping as well. Uh, so all of these things take a toll on our bodies as well as on us psychologically. And one of the tolls it takes is a potential increase in risk of illnesses like cancer. Again, we get cancer because we're biological beings, but the combination of major stress and this biological vulnerability seems to shift the odds in the direction of higher risk of getting cancer. The authors of this study <coughs> say this finding suggests a role for life events in breast cancer etiology through hormonal or other mechanisms. So, uh, and I'll talk to you later on about what some of these hormonal mechanisms may be. One of the other major forms of stress response that we worry about in treating people with cancer is depression. Uh, this sculpture was done by a Dutch uh, cancer patient. Um, and one of the remarkable things about it is not just how well it depicts her despair, but also uh, it's the only work of art she did in her life. And it's really just, I think, a remarkable piece of sculpture in addition to everything else about it. Um, in fact, a substantial minority of people with serious medical illness suffered depression. Uh, the rate of major depression, people who have major depression feel hopeless, helpless, and worthless. Many of them are suicidal. They have low energy. They don't sleep well. They tend to wake up early in the morning, can't get back to sleep. They're fatigued. Um, the rate of major depression in the general population is 3%, which is a pretty hefty number. But if you survey medical outpatients, the rate doubles. It's 6%. If you look at medical inpatients, it's 12%. So one out of nine patients over here in the hospital not only has their primary medical problem, but they have major depression as well. 
We know that depressed people are suicidal. They don't think much of themselves. They feel they're not worth anything. They feel like a burden. Uh, and it doesn't surprise me at all that uh, many of them are suicidal. What surprises me is that some doctors actually consider killing them. Um, and I think before anybody does, they ought to get a psychiatric consult, start the patient on antidepressants, and reread the Hippocratic Oath. That uh, the answer to terminal illness is not killing patients prematurely, but treating them with dignity, controlling their pain, uh, providing them adequate social and other support. Uh, and that kind of compassion um, can go a long way toward helping people. Even at the end of life, depression is quite uh, treatable. I um, had occasion to be stat page to the Oncology Daycare Center um, when a, um, uh, a gentleman who was very near death had tried to jump out the window, commit, a, commit suicide. And he was clearly within weeks of dying from lung cancer. Um, and he had no prior history of depression or suicidal thinking. And so they brought him in, and they called me down. And there he was, slumped over in a wheelchair with three generations standing around him in tears. And I asked him what was going on. And he said, um, well, I'm just a burden to them. They'd be better off without me. And I know some families didn't actually think that, but it was very clear that that was not the case here. So um, I said to him, you know, uh, every one of these people around you is, is going to die one day, and they're looking to you for a model for how to do it. And frankly, you're doing a lousy job of it. And the oncologist kind of looked <laughs> heavenward. And there was a long pause. You know, he, he was thinking to himself, I thought I had trouble before I called the psychiatrist here. you know." And, and there was a long pause. And then the guy called his son-in-law over. And he said, you know, that air conditioner in my bedroom has been broken for two weeks, and I want you to fix it. And he started acting like the head of his family again. And he died peacefully a couple of weeks later. And he felt useless because people had not bothered to remind him of his obligation to them, that even when people are very close to death, they have obligations to their loved ones. And if you can find that kind of meaning in life, life can have a great deal of importance to the patient and to their family. Uh, I was lecturing a couple years ago at the Mayo Clinic, and they brought me around to, um, uh, I, not just to give the lecture, but I, they did an unusual thing. They had me come on work rounds in the hospital. And they introduced me to a woman who was dying that day. This was her last day. And she's one of the most hopeful people I've ever met in my life. She told me that she had a series of appointments with all of her family, and she had a piece of her mind to give each one of them about what they were doing wrong and how they ought to live their lives. And that was her plan for the day before she died. And the, you know, the idea that just because you're terminally ill, that there's no meaning or hope in your life, is just plain wrong. And uh, I think we, we focus too much on prognosis and not enough on meaning, on what life really means to people who are dying. Um, being depressed, uh, like having major stressors, can alter the odds in terms of cancer risk. Now, again, not all studies show this. Many studies show no relationship between depression and cancer. But this is one very well-done study uh, in which uh, Brenda Penix found that um, people who had major depression on three separate episodes, so they had both the most severe and the most chronic kind of depression, actually were at almost twofold elevated risk for getting cancer. Uh, and there are more studies that show that depression predicts cancer progression, uh, that if you're depressed, uh, you're more likely to die sooner of cancer. So depression is not a good thing from the point of view of cancer risk and cancer progression. Now, again, we don't treat depression vigorously because we think it's going to cure people of cancer. We treat depression because it's a treatable illness and it's a lousy thing to have and you feel a lot better if you're not depressed. And we have a, both medications and psychotherapies that are very effective in treating depression. Uh, the problem is often that we overlook it in people who are medically ill because we misattribute the symptoms of depression to the symptoms of disease. Well, of course, she isn't sleeping while she's worried about her cancer. And she hasn't got an appetite because she's on chemotherapy and she feels nauseated. Uh, and her energy is poor because she got radiotherapy, which it can aff affect energy. So it's easy to explain away all of the symptoms of depression uh, as simply problems related to cancer. Now, sometimes you have problems related to cancer, but sometimes you have both. And having cancer is certainly no protection against having depression at the same time. And in fact, it increases the odds that you might. So it's important to recognize uh, the symptoms of depression. And, and my, my sort of helpful tip for medical students about how to tell when somebody is depressed uh, is, you know, we often have an emotional reaction to people who have certain kinds of illness. Being around anxious people tends to make you anxious. 
being around depressed people doesn't sometimes makes you depressed, but more often it makes you angry. Depressed people are frustrating because they feel hopeless and worthless and helpless. They can't do anything. They keep complaining over and over and don't get better. And if you find yourself getting really angry with somebody, um, more than seems to make sense, start asking yourself the question, are they depressed? And are they just not responding, not because they won't, but because they can't? Um, and uh, get them help. This is a, a drawing made by a French cancer patient who uh, is, is saying that the treatment is long and very hard to, to undergo. And uh, one of the many stressors cancer patients have to deal with is, is uh, these kinds of treatments. We also find that the way people manage their emotions complicates the problem itself. So that people who tend to suppress uh, their anger, suppress or their other emotions, wind up being more depressed than those who don't. So trying to sit on feelings that you have that are unpleasant actually makes things worse rather than better. Uh, and there's evidence, in addition, that the way you manage emotion may have an effect on the rate of cancer progression. So people who tend to suppress emotion or repress it, suppressing it means I feel bad and I'm trying not to feel bad. Repressing it means I'm not even aware of how bad I'm feeling, that it's so characteristic for me to just keep feelings out of, out of view that I'm not even aware that I'm uh, putting them out of view. But there's some evidence that cancer patients are more prone to being like that, and, and that being like that is not good for you either psychologically or medically. So what do we do to try to help people deal with these problems? Well, we've developed a, th a psychotherapy technique called supportive expressive group therapy that we've used now for more than 20 years. And we have a great deal of experience in helping patients cope better with these life-threatening situations uh, with this and other techniques. But I'm going to focus uh, on this one, which involves seven themes, building new bonds of social support, encouraging the expression of emotion, detoxifying fears of dying and death, reordering priorities in life, fortifying families, clarifying communication with doctors, and learning to manage um, symptoms. And I'll show you how we do some of that. This is just a reminder that there are many kinds of both individual and group therapies to, to provide emotional support for cancer patients. I don't pretend to cover all of them or say that this is the only one or the best, but it's the one we have the most experience uh, with here. So that's what I'm going to talk about uh, tonight. For those who are more interested in more information about uh, how we do it, we have a book called Group Therapy for Cancer Patients that goes into great detail about how we um, do this published by Basic Books. So the first of the seven themes is building bonds. We try to create a new network of social support. Uh, one of the problems that often afflicts people with cancer is that um, friends and family even are afraid to utter the dreaded C word or even worse, the D word, as though you know somehow it will set you into a tailspin if you hear cancer mentioned, as though it isn't what you're thinking about most of the time anyway. But it, it confronts people with their own anxiety about cancer and other illnesses, um, and they, they don't know how to deal with it. So very often, social relationships get worse. At a time when you need them more, you get less. People are afraid to talk about it, don't know what to say or do. Uh, and one of the nice things about being in a support group is that the very thing that makes you excluded, feel excluded from the rest of the world is your ticket of admission to the support group. Uh, Groucho Marx once said that he would never stoop so low as to join a club whose standards were so poor that they would admit him as a member. <laughs> and uh, very often people find that it's so refreshing to be in a group with people who all are going through the same stigma that you are. There's a kind of social glue that gets set up in support groups that, that occurs quickly and lasts for a long time. I have two groups of metastatic breast cancer patients have been running for 10 years. These women, some of them have come every week uh, for up to 10 years in these groups because, it, uh, as one woman said, I, it's the least superficial thing I do in my life. You know, I feel understood here. I help others. They help me. It also helps people discover common problems to normalize problems, to realize that people are acting weird not because you forgot their birthday you know, or aren't playing golf as much, but because they're freaked out about how you're having cancer and don't know what to say. And that's what's happened to other people in the group. And so it helps to normalize their reactions to it. Um, there's also a way in which being in these groups gives meaning to an otherwise meaningless tragedy. There's nothing good about getting cancer. 
But if you can use your experience with cancer to help other people cope better, then something genuinely good has come out of a bad situation. Uh, one of my patients came, came in one day with this wicked gleam in her eye, and she said, you know, I just found out something about Kaiser, you know. I used to uh, think that you had to wait three weeks to get the report of your bone scan, but I found out that if you walk up to the desk after your scan and say, I want the technologist reading of the scan, you can get it. They have to give it to you. And it's not the definitive reading, but it is a reading, and it gives you an idea of whether or not you've, there's been progression in your cancer or not. And you don't have to wait three weeks to get some idea of what it's like. So she said, I want you to try it next week, you know. And so they pass along these little secrets about how to get the best out of uh, healthcare systems. Um, you know, it, it may strike people as strange uh, that, for example, after the, uh, the shootings in Littleton, Colorado, parents from Paducah, Kentucky, who had lost children in the high school shootings, called them up and said, listen, here's what you're going through. Let me try to help you get through this. Now, you might wonder, why would they do that? You know, why would they revisit their own pain? Because they wanted something genuinely good to come out of their own personal tragedy. And if at least they could help other families a bit deal with what they were going through, uh, they felt something good was coming out of a bad situation. This has been defined as the helper therapy principle. There's a sociologist named Frank Reisman who died uh, about a month ago. Um, he was studying reading problems in schools, and he got the weird idea. He had second graders who couldn't read and sixth graders who couldn't read. And he got, the, normally what they do is give them some extra tutoring and it didn't work. But he had the rather strange idea of assigning the sixth graders who couldn't read as tutors for the second graders who couldn't read. And the results of the experiment were that the second graders still weren't reading better, but the sixth graders were. That just being put in the role of helper rather than, you know, pathetic uh, student helped them to learn better. And, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's something we all know in medicine, you know, that uh, we learn by teaching other people. You know, when I learned procedures in medical school, uh, uh, the, the rule was see one, screw one, do one, teach one. That that was how you <laughs> learned to do things. And you consolidated what you knew by teaching other people how to do it. Well, if it, if it works for healthcare professionals, it ought to work for patients, too. And you know what it does, that they, they feel better from helping one another. So the person getting the help learns something, and the person giving the help starts to feel more confident about how they're coping with the illness. One of our patients was a frustrated poet, and by the time she died, she'd published two books of poetry. This was one of her poems. Most of us don't know, and those who do won't tell. So we build you a reason, a barrier to shut out any probing of our scars, self-inflicted or not. If you will love us a little and let us weep when we must, we may find out who we are. The second major theme in our groups is expressing emotion. And this is where what we do differs from many of what you may have heard of as cognitive behavioral approaches, which try to teach people sort of how to think about problems that they're facing. Um, our emotion system is there for a reason. You know, the, the brain is a remarkable computer. Uh, there are more uh, synapses, that is, connections between neurons in the brain than there are in any of your brains than there are stars in the universe. It's extraordinarily complex. And the way in which we manage the vast amount of information that, that we process in our brain every day is by forgetting most of it or putting away most of it um, and having a signal system to say this matters, this is important, and that's our emotions. So we tend to pay attention to things that we get strong emotional reactions about. And that's a very adaptive system that we have evolved to tell us what matters and what doesn't. It can be painful at times. It can be joyous at times. But the emotion system is not the problem. It's a resource. And yet most of the time, we fight our emotions. We struggle with them. Emotions are things that happen to us. We don't choose them. They happen to us. And it's a matter of paying attention to them and using them. And what we do in these groups is encourage people to talk about whatever it is they're feeling uh, and in, in a more open way. And patients often struggle with this. So what I'd like to do is show you a bit of a video clip here um, of how we encourage some patients early in a group meeting uh, to deal with emotions that were occurring uh, in relationship to having cancers. You like you're feeling sad right now. I'm looking for signs of emotion. No, I don't think I feel sad. For someone who is feeling worried but not quite able yet to talk about it. But you're not used to having someone to really comfort you when you are feeling sad. No. I don't know. I've always felt that one doesn't have to look very far to see someone far worse off than they are. And that's what keeps people from getting depressed, I think. 
after six weeks, Ramona is still struggling with the idea that she is somehow weak if she expresses her feelings. Yeah, but we all struggle with feelings of sadness and with wanting some help for ourselves, and yet it's hard to ask for it. I still get on myself for this. I'll see people who are worse off, and I'll think, how dare you? How dare you even once feel sorry for yourself? And it's taken me a long time to realize my feelings are important. Did you feel that Ramona was feeling sorry for herself or trying to get sympathy? Not at all. I don't think that your feelings are really that much different. I just think that they're more infrequent and you were raised to deal with them just a little bit differently. They gain not only by what they receive, but by what they give. You know, getting cancer is a meaningless tragedy, really. But if you can use your experience as a cancer patient to give something to someone else, to help them cope with it, you feel better about yourself as well. It's what we call the helper therapy principle. So I think in many ways, groups provide a sense of being part of the human race, being connected, and a mutual giving and receiving that is a very powerful form of therapy. I'm wondering, we've got a few minutes left. If we could each take a minute to think about what would I want to get from the group before it's over today? Test the waters a little more. So what, do I, what do I want? Because mm -hmm. if it's hard in here, I can imagine it's really hard outside. My main objective was to come in and help someone else regain hope. Because you can get through it. I'd like to make sure that what I do what I decide to do with treatment and things for cancer uh, is the best thing to do. Gerald called me after I didn't show up last week. I thought, somebody cares that I wasn't feeling well. And when she so, called, you felt terrible. Yeah. And I think that that's what I want from this group is to find people who are supportive and caring about me. And what do you want? What do you want from me? I didn't really come wanting anything. I just volunteered for the study, and here I am. <laughs> Ramona said that, um, you know, that here I am. She didn't, she didn't need anything. She, she said uh, at another meeting, you know, to Debbie, actually, the other woman who spoke, um, you know, it's just not fair. You know, I've lived my life, and you haven't. And so what right do I have to feel sorry for myself? And Debbie said to her, a minute of your life is worth as much as a minute of mine. Um, and in fact, you'll notice that Debbie, who was angry at herself for feeling bad, um, uh, could see the legitimacy of Ramona's feeling bad better than she could see it in herself. And one of the nice things that happens in groups is that you can see in other people something that you're having difficulty seeing for yourself. Uh, and it's much easier to accept when you see it in someone else than it is for yourself. And that's one of the many ways that these groups help, uh, the people in these groups help one another. So we encourage people to talk openly about how they're feeling, uh, not always with great success, but sometimes we do. We hope that people will see emotion as a source of closeness rather than it being something that, that isolates them or makes them feel separate from other people. Many patients feel stuck in what we call the prison of positive thinking, you know, that they have to put on a happy face at all times. This is an old advertisement that says, Moyer's Oil of Gladness. Now, this isn't Bill Moyer's, although the, uh, the, the tape I've showed you in another one, I will, is from Bill Moyer's Healing in the Mind series. But patients feel imprisoned, that they, you know, that they're being mean to people if they show them how they actually feel. And that's just an additional burden for them. It means they not only feel bad, but they feel bad about feeling bad. They don't have the right to show it to anyone else. And they got enough to deal with without adi that additional burden. Thomas Jefferson said, when angry count 10 before you speak, if very angry count 100. Mark Twain said, when angry count four, when very angry swear. Uh, we're more on the Mark Twain side of this one. We think he, uh, he had a point. <clears throat> and in fact, when we've looked at people who tend to control emotions with cancer versus those who don't, we find that those who are high in emotional control, the green bars, are actually more likely to be anxious and depressed than those who are low in emotional control, despite the tendency to underreport it. So it just doesn't work. When you have a stressor that is going to make you feel bad, if you're trying to, to put down any of those feelings, you wind up feeling worse. It's sort of like the pressure cooker model. You wind up feeling worse rather than better. It just doesn't work. 
Shakespeare, as usual, said it best. He said, give sorrow words the grief that does not speak, whispers the orphraught heart, and bids it break. We found uh, uh, recently that we're able to do something in these groups that has not been reported in the psychotherapy literature before, and that is we're actually able to change how people manage their emotions. So we have evidence that people who are in our support groups decrease in their tendency to suppress emotions, whereas people who are randomly assigned, that is, I'll be talking about random assignment in studies, randomized clinical trials are sort of the gold standard of clinical research because what you do is you take a group of people and use a toss of a coin or a computer program to decide who gets treatment and who doesn't. If you allowed people to choose treatment and then you noticed a difference, you'd never know whether it was the kind of person who would choose that treatment that accounted for the difference or not. So in randomized trials, we just make a random assignment of who gets one treatment and another or who gets no treatment. And then you can presume that if there's any difference at some follow-up point, the difference is due to the treatment. So in this case, half of them, a uh, little less than half of them, uh, more than half of them got our supportive expressive group therapy Another group didn't, and the ones who got group therapy decreased their tendency to control their emotions, whereas the control group, if anything, increased a little. So we were actually teaching them to be more accepting of their emotions. And despite that, they felt more competent in managing their emotions. We gave them a measure that's called self-efficacy. You ask people, well, how competent do you feel in managing your emotions? Now, typically, People think of emotional expression as like Pandora's box. You know, once I open the box, they're out there. Things will disintegrate. I'll never get control of them again. Well, I've never lost a patient in terminal crying. You know, they start crying, and then they stop crying. Uh, and in fact, we found the opposite, that when people, people make a kind of devil's bargain, that when they suppress bad feelings, they tend to suppress all feelings. They don't just stop feeling bad or try to stop feeling bad. They don't allow themselves to feel anything. And oddly enough, when people are more open about how they feel, including sadness, anger, and fear, they're also more joyful. Uh, we were having one very grim discussion of uh, a woman was saying, you know, my husband is useless at planning anything. He's hopeless. And I don't want to leave him with the burden of planning what to do with my remains. So I called up Skylawn Park and asked them what it would cost for me to be buried there. And they quoted me some astronomical amount of money. Uh, real estate, you know, is very expensive in the Bay Area. and. Um, she said to the woman on the phone, well, you know, actually, I represent a group of women who are looking for a place to be buried. And there was a long pause. And the woman said, Skylawn Park does not offer group discounts. <laughs> and they all, they all got a good laugh out of trying to get a group discount at a cemetery. And, and it reinforces the point that you can be talking about something very grim and very sad, but you can do it in a way that actually unleashes all kinds of other feelings, including getting a laugh out of how you're trying to do it. So in fact, what we try to do in these groups is help people detoxify their fears of dying and death, uh, encourage them to face rather than avoid even the worst fears. We're particularly death phobic in this culture. You know, there was one woman in Beverly Hills who had in her will a provision that had her buried bolt upright in the front seat of her Maserati when she was buried, as if she was just going to drive off somewhere in the underworld. I don't know what she thought she was doing. But we tend to be very avoidant in dealing with dying and death. And that tends to actually make it worse, because many people have never seen somebody die. Uh, one of my patients said, you know, I watched a friend of mine die last week, and it wasn't pretty, but it wasn't that awful. I realized for the first time that I could do it. It wasn't that ugly. Uh, and if you ask people about death, you know, none of us can comprehend death. You know, some of us have religious beliefs that help us understand what will happen. Others don't, but they say, well, it'll be your problem, not mine, after I'm gone. But what most people are more worried about is the process of dying than death itself. And there's a lot we can do about the process of dying. There's a lot we can do about decisions about treatments, uh, about not being isolated from loved ones, about meaning in the remainder of our lives about controlling symptoms like pain, making medical decisions. Those are all things you can do something about. And as you think about that, you know, the essence of trauma is helplessness. It's being out of control of what's happening to your body. And yet very often we experience ourselves as being helpless in the course of medical treatment. And if you find a way to participate in treatment, uh, you feel less helpless and less overwhelmed, even about something as ultimate as uh, death and dying itself. Uh, and so we talk about, we face death directly in the group, we talk about it openly, we grieve losses, we go to memorial services, 
uh, when one patient died, another, our poet, wrote these cards that she distributed to the group. Dear Eva, whenever the wind is from the sea, salty and strong, you are here. Remembering your zest for hilltops and the sturdy surf of your laughter, gentles my grief at your going and tempers the thought of my own. You know, on the one hand, it's frightening and upsetting to see somebody else die of the same disease. But on the other hand, in valuing the person who died and grieving them, you're also seeing the value that you carry with yourself and that other people will experience in you. And so oddly enough, it's reassuring rather than frightening to be grieving people who have died. And so what I'd like to do now is show you another segment uh, about how the group handled with uh, the first loss of a group member. Our October 2nd meeting uh, was sweet and sad. The members were dealing in a more palpable way than they had previously with fears of dying. Debbie talked about planning her trip to Hawaii and how much she was looking forward to it. And at the same time, she knew that this would likely be her very last trip. Um, this is October 30th, 1991. Uh, it was a pivotal uh, meeting for the group uh, because it was the first meeting after Debbie had died. Um, clearly, the group was challenged uh, to face what they most feared and emerge either feeling closer and more supported or demoralized. I mean, do, do we know anything? Had That's what I was going to say. What happened to What Debbie? happened? I'd like to know what I mean, happened. What do we know? My understanding is that she got some fluid in her lungs and uh, that a decision was made not to be extremely aggressive in trying to, um, to treat that, that they felt that it, uh, the prognosis was not good. Well, I'm angry that I don't have a chance to say goodbye. I mean, it just feels so... She did. Abrupt. Yes. And we weren't able to do anything not knowing. Yes. Wow. How does that, you would have wanted to be able to. Yeah. Well, at least I would have, yeah. Some of the flowers. Something. Yeah. The issue that I hear everyone talking about is the lack of predictability. In the uh -huh. sense that here was Debbie talking about her trip to Hawaii and now she's not with us. Yes. There was a big bubble there of of euphoria for her, and it, and it was gone, and it wasn't a bubble. It was a big, deep hole. I wish I had known her better. I wish I had known her before cancer. I keep thinking, what was she like before? You know, because we never really knew the real Debbie, because she said that that wasn't the real Debbie. I invested in her. I had feelings for her. Can you tell us about them, Sheila? being sick and guilty for dying on them and they'll they they will continue and what you're doing in that group is marching death right there in the center of that circle and forcing those women to look at it that's right they can't turn their eyes away from it you're rubbing their nose in it uh, but what do you notice what aspect of debbie's death are is the group focusing on what um, the surprise yes what else? That they were able to be there with her. Right. To support her, that's right. They, they, they lost the connection. Right, so they lost the connection, but suddenly. Yes? Somebody else had a... Well, so part of what they're doing in, in focusing on the surprise and the lack of connection is they're beginning to define norms, standards, for a better way of dying. 
They're saying that if you can be with someone, if you can exchange, you know, say goodbye, reassurance uh, before you go, that's a better way to die. It's better for the person who's dying. It's better for us as well. Uh, and so they're beginning to take control even of death by defining better ways to go through the process of dying. Uh, and, you know, what Sheila said, um, uh, you know, that, uh, that she would have comforted her saying, you know, don't feel guilty for dying on them. At first I thought, what? You know, who would feel guilty for dying? But you know what people do? They feel they're letting down their loved ones, that they don't, that they're abandoning them. Uh, and uh, that has served me well in, in, uh, in working with patients since then. So I think it's, a, it's important that patients come up with ways of understanding what dying people are going through and helping them with it. Uh, and I found time and again that patients could be extraordinarily helpful to one another uh, in the course of dying. Uh, we had one situation in which we would sometimes go to patients' homes when they were too ill to come into the group. And there was one rather young woman who was dying, had a, was d divorced from her husband and, and had a rather bad relationship with him and was very upset that her young children were going to have to go to her husband after she died. She didn't think much of him as a husband or as a father. And uh, the, the Sandy, the woman with the dark curly hair, and I, I'm using their names with their permission because they were on this show and, you know, 40 million people saw it the first time, so the usual confidentiality with their consent uh, did not apply. Sandy um, said, you know, I want to tell you a story. She said, my sister died 30 years ago, and her husband was a son of a bitch. We, none of us could stand him, and we all thought he would be an absolutely terrible father and my niece went to him after she died, and he surprised all of us. He actually turned into a very good, caring father, and she grew up fine. Now, that was something that was so much more reassuring to the woman who was dying than anything I could have said, because it was a life experience uh, from a similar situation. So it's no promise that that's what would happen, but it was of tremendous comfort to her. So patients find ways to give great comfort to one another, and they grow from dealing with these problems. I had occasion a few years ago to talk about this work to the Dalai Lama when he was here at Stanford. And um, when we started this in the 70s, frankly, a lot of doctors were afraid we'd make patients worse. You know, they said, look, you're putting together women with metastatic breast cancer, you know, they're going to start dying, they're going to get demoralized and frightened. Well, you could see from this tape that, yes, they were upset by it, but they weren't going to pieces, they weren't panicking, they weren't disintegrating. Death is not a novel concept to a cancer patient. So they, they understood it could happen, and they were learning how to deal with it. So I asked the Dalai Lama why he thought, from his Buddhist perspective, that it might be helpful rather than hurtful to, to have cancer patients meet in groups. And he thought for a minute, and he said, well, I have a very busy travel schedule. And I thought, we're not communicating here, you know. Um, and his English is very good. And he said, and it makes me anxious. And when I get anxious about it, I call over one of my assistants, and I say, what am I doing for the next three days? And he tells me, and I feel better. He said, that's the way we Buddhists feel about death. We make it familiar, and it becomes less frightening. And he understood exactly what was going on and what we were talking about. So I think it's very important to, to recognize uh, that people have extraordinary abilities to cope with situations like that if you give them half a chance to do it. Uh, Emily said, what I found is at the beginning in the group, it's a bit like that fear you have standing at the top of a tall building or at the edge of the Grand Canyon. At first, you're afraid to even look down. I don't like heights. But gradually, you learn to do it, and you can see that falling down would be a disaster. Nonetheless, you feel better about yourself because you're able to look. That's how I feel about death in the group. I can't say I feel serene, but I can look at it. Um, one of the other things we do in the group is help people reorder their priorities in life. Um, uh, you know, as I mentioned, many people say, you know, my life hasn't been the same since I got cancer, but in many ways it's better. And one thing it does is it, it helps you to trivialize the trivial. You know, you learn not to worry about stuff that you used to worry about all the time. Or as my mentor and colleague, Irvi Alam, says, cancer cures neurosis. You know, you, you don't have time to be neurotically worried about things. It frees you in a way. You know, if you know you're not going to live for the next 50 years and you know that your resources of dealing with things or spending time are limited, then you sometimes make wiser choices about it. And this isn't being demoralized. It's not giving in to the disease. It's being realistic. What we teach patients to do is hope for the best but prepare for the worst. Uh, Sandy, the woman with the dark curly hair, had a daughter who was three units shy of graduating from a university in Boston. And she had missed the units because she was flying back to see her mom. And she wanted to take the extra units and graduate with her class, and the dean wouldn't let her do it. 
So Sandy called up the dean, and she said, I want you to let my daughter do this. And the dean said, we have our rules. Why should I? Sandy said, because a year and a half ago, my oncologist told me I have a year to live with cancer, and I want to be alive to see my daughter graduate from your college. And the dean said, oh my god, you're so brave. You're so wonderful. How many units does she want? She, anything. She can do anything she wants. And uh, her daughter called up Sandy and said, what did you do to the dean? <laughs> anyway, um, I was giving a talk um, in Connecticut somewhere, and a woman came up to me after, and she said, I know who you're talking about, because she, her daughter was best friends with my daughter, and I saw her there at that graduation. And I'm here to tell you that she watched her daughter graduate, not just from college, but from law school before she died. So she wasn't giving in to the cancer. She wasn't giving up. She was saying, if I don't have infinite time, then I want to make sure life goes the way I want it to go as much as I can. So finding ways to face the limitations imposed by the illness and live as fully as can as you can is a challenge, but something that people really benefit from in dealing with cancer, although not everybody gets it. The doctor says, I'm sorry, Mr. Rainey, our tests show you have two weeks to live. And he says, can I take them in August? <laughs> I don't think he quite got the concept. Um, I had occasion, actually, to thank um, uh, the Pope uh, last November for the model that he's given to people for coping with life-threatening illness. You know, he has Parkinson's, and he's chosen to carry on rather than to, uh, uh, to just give into it and retire. And I think that has set a good example for people who, who are going to keep on, carry on doing what they can as long as they can. And he's actually clear as a bell. I uh, didn't even have a tremor when I, when I shook his hand, actually. I probably had more of a tremor than he did. Um, but he is just carrying on, and I think it's a model for people who are ill. Um, we try to encourage patients uh, with, to help their families better, and families help the patients better as well. That improving relationships with families is another very important dimension. Uh, and cancer is a tremendous burden to families, not just to cancer patients. Um, uh, we've had family groups that have met once a month where the family members talk about what it's like for them. Uh, one husband said, this group is a place where I come to feel better about feeling bad. Because uh, cancer tends to trump everything else. You know, the, the husband um, is, uh, has to go to a job he doesn't like, but he can't change work because the insurance companies will uh, disallow care for his wife because of pre-existing condition, one of the many scams insurance companies run on patients. Uh, he comes home tired from a day of work, has to cook dinner and take out the garbage. Uh, uh, he's not sleeping well because he's worried about his wife and his family, but he's not the one with the problem. Well, he has problems. They're different problems from what the patient has. And we encourage patients to, to engage in role flexibility, to find ways they can help one another. One, one such husband uh, was telling his eight-year-old daughter, listen, don't bother mommy about your homework. I'll help you with it after I do the dishes. And he heard an explosion from the bedroom. His wife said, I can't cook, I can't clean. About the only thing I can do is help our daughter with her homework, and I'm going to do it. And that was a good thing, you know, that she was saying, there are some things I can do, I want to be able to do it. Uh, another couple uh, was having what they referred to as their taco fight, because um, she, they were both physicians. Uh, she was so determined not to let cancer interfere with her life that she was on a a uh, business trip to China and, and tripped over a uh, hidden a wire in a theater in China and had a pathological fracture of her leg, had to be medevac back, but she wasn't going to give an inch. She was home recuperating and was cooking tacos for her husband and her son, and she realized at the last minute she'd forgotten to get lettuce. And many cancer patients worry about chemo brain, you know, they just feel they're not thinking as clearly, remembering as clearly, and she had a complete meltdown. Uh, and her husband said, well, look, um, I could go get some lettuce. And she yelled at him, can't you eat tacos without lettuce? <laughs> and he realized that if he had said, let's not bother with lettuce, she would have yelled at him, can't you go out and get some lettuce? That she was just so frustrated you know, with what was going on uh, that she just needed somebody to understand. Uh, another husband at a, at a group meeting said, my wife was so weak, she was a computer programmer, with fatigue from, from her chemotherapy that she couldn't get up off the floor in the living room. And I kept trying to offer helpful suggestions or say it wasn't so bad or we could do this or we could do that. And every time I did, she got angrier and angrier. And he said, finally, I realized that I'd failed completely. So I got down on the floor and I cried with her. And then he smiled and he said, that turned out to be the right thing to do. <laughs> that she didn't want it fixed. She just wanted somebody to understand how frustrated she was with it. And often that's a problem between men and women. That for men, the model of a problem is a broken muffler in a car. You know, you just identify the problem and you fix it. <laughs> 
And for women, that's not what they want. They don't want the problem fixed. They want the situation understood. And as the men talked about that more, they kind of got it, that there were different ways to respond that might be more helpful. I mentioned that um, cancer patients often feel punished by their doctors. And this is a drawing of a French cancer patient who you know, uh, expressed her feeling of mutilation in uh, having a mastectomy. Uh, and so relationships with docs are problematic to begin with because patients will consciously or unconsciously feel punished by their doctors, even though they know the doctors are doing the best they can for them. Uh, doctors have troubles too. I'm sorry, Mr. McConnell, your insurance plan only provides for empathetic nodding and a saddened downward glance. There is a $200 copay for any additional words of compassion, not to exceed 40 words or three expressions of sympathy or condolence. And all I can say is I wish this were funny. You know, we have a very serious problem in the United States. Uh, the the health care financing in this country is nothing short of being a disaster. And we waste vast quantities of, of money paying uh, bloated uh, salaries for insurance company executives. 20, 27 cents of every dollar in the United States goes to paperwork overhead and insurance company profits. Only 25 cents in the dollar goes to pay doctors. So we're spending more money on the health insurance system than we are on the, on the salaries of doctors who deliver medical care. And you know what? The insurance industry has no business in health care, and we ought to just throw the bastards out. They are just wrecking health care in the United States. They're trying to get us to do risk assessment, and they're making medical decisions, and it's just wrong. And uh, we've really got to fix it. And uh, I've warned you know, my staff never use the term provider. It's a demeaning term. You know, did you ever hear a mother say, there he goes, my son, the provider? You know, I don't think so. But when, when, when countries used to colonize other countries, I, I, I use the past tense, I'm not sure I should, um, they find a demeaning term for the natives of the country to provide a justification for the colonization. You know, they're not real humans, they're X or Y. And that's what the insurance industry has done with health care. You know, doctors, nurses, psychologists, social workers are now all term providers, which is an insult. Uh, but it's a way of justifying taking control over care, and it's making it harder for us to do what we need to do to provide the best possible care. The things we need to do uh, are summarized by three C's, communication, control, and caring. Um, we encourage patients to get clear answers from their docs. If they have questions, if you've got that list of questions, hand it to the doc at the beginning, not the end of the interview. So the doc actually has time to deal with the questions uh, that you've brought. Um, control is very important. Patients who participate in treatment decisions are happier regardless of what decision they've made. There are several studies now of um, the decision to have a lumpectomy and radiation versus mastectomy for breast cancer. And they both show very surprisingly that the long-term psychological outcome isn't all that different between lumpectomy and mastectomy, which surprises me, frankly. But what is different is that the patients who felt they participated in making the decision are happier regardless of which decision they made. So people feel better when they're in control, when they're participating in their treatment choices. Now, there are some situations where there really is no choice. There's a right and a wrong thing to do. But in a lot of cancer patient treatment, it's a risk-benefit calculation. And you may get a, a, an, an incremental benefit, but at the risk of serious side effects or taking yourself away from things you want to do with, with your life while you've got it. And there is, there is reason to make risk-benefit decisions that a doctor alone can't make and shouldn't make, and the patient should make in conjunction with the doctor. And so finding ways to feel in control of medical treatment, to understand it and participate in it, is a very important part of good medical care. One of the things we've done for years in the cancer center here is audio tape important consultations with docs, because patients just can't get it at the beginning. It's too overwhelming. It's too emotional. But if you go home with a cassette, you can listen to it a second, a third, a fourth time. And, and you begin to get the full meaning of what the consultation said. I learned this lesson when I had the um, terrible misfortune of being on sabbatical in Paris and working at the Institut Curie. Uh, and I actually ran several groups there because I wanted to see whether these saying, you know, California's love sharing experiences. I thought maybe it would be different in a rather more formal culture. And one of my patients in the group was also an oncologist at the Curie who had breast cancer. And she said, you know, I had the weirdest experience. She said, I. 
I went over the weekend to a cancer congress in Paris to see whether the treatment I was getting was the best possible treatment. And I sat there like a doctor listening to all this. I understood it all. I decided my doctor was making good decisions and it was fine. This morning, I was in his office as a patient, and I couldn't understand a thing he was saying to me. Same person, doctor, oncologist. But the stress, the emotional arousal that comes with being a patient, the implications of what the doctor's saying can be so overwhelming that it's hard to process the information. So finding ways to do that, listening to tapes, talking it over, getting yourself informed in other ways, is an important part of being the kind of patient who feels in control of their treatment and who will be happier with the treatment. The third C is caring. Um, and I think this is a part of medicine that we have tended to, um, to lose in the 20th century, both because of the advent of scientific medicine and because of the predations of the insurance industry on health care. Um, uh, the oldest adage of medicine is that our job is to cure rarely, relieve suffering often, and comfort always. In the 20th century, with the genuine excitement of the advances of scientific medicine, curing many uh, bacterial infections, uh, lowering mortality from heart disease and cancer, uh, we rewrote our job description to be that our job is to cure always, relieve suffering if you have the time, and let somebody else do the comforting. And, you know, no matter what we do in medicine, no matter how good we get, the death rate will always be one per person. You know, sooner or later, we're all going to die of something, and we're going to need a knowledgeable professional to help us do it. And so to focus solely on cure, which is wonderful when we can do it, misses the point of what most of medicine is really about. Uh, and people value the sense of caring from docs. I mean, we know that's true because Kaiser now has cheesy advertisements saying you will get a caring physician like Dr. Ellen so-and-so uh, if you sign up with Kaiser. They under, their marketing people understand that people want and need that. American, 42% of Americans are now spending more money out of pocket on alternative medicine than they are in mainstream medicine out of pocket. It's two-thirds of Californians, of course. We're always ahead of the curve. Um, why are they doing it? Well, you know what? The average doctor spends seven minutes with a patient going down. The average alternative practitioner, 30 minutes a patient. So just do the math. People want some time with a professional who cares about them and helping them live with their illness. And uh, while certainly uh, we need to continue to develop the technological advances in medicine, it will never be all there is to medicine. And people want and need somebody, particularly when they're seriously ill, uh, who can help them navigate that course. And feeling cared about by docs is tremendously important. The seventh thing is uh, teaching people symptom management techniques. This is my daughter's description of what I do. She says, my dad hypnotizes people and makes them want to live longer. And you see a particularly successful clinical example <laughs> here. <laughs> you know, Julia says to me, are you still showing that drawing? She's, uh, she did this when she was, I think, in first grade, and she's now a sophomore at Stanford. But I said, it's too good not to use, so, so I do. Um, one of the things we do is teach patients techniques like self-hypnosis, which uh, is just a form of highly focused attention uh, that can help people disconnect from uncomfortable experiences. As a little experiment right now, you're having sensations in your bodies touching these wonderful chairs that the Cancer Center has provided. Hopefully, those sensations in your bottoms and elsewhere were not foremost in your mind until I brought them to your attention. The brain is very good at tuning in on certain feelings and tuning out others in the service of doing what you want to do. If you can do it with this, you can do it with pain. You don't have to pay attention to pain. This diagram uh, is from the work of Ronald Melzack and Pat Wall, who, dis who, who developed the gate control theory of pain, which is why we use sometimes transcutaneous nerve stimulators to compete with the pain input and reduce pain processing in the spinal cord. But they also noticed that descending input from the cortex could reduce pain perception, as you see here. I think what you can see is the baby's getting the shot here, and the father is the one who's in pain. So a lot of the pain experience is not just the sensation, but how upset you are by the sensation. Um, uh, or the way I like to teach that to the medical students is to remind them that the strain in pain lies mainly in the brain. That that's, you have to pay attention to pain for it to hurt, and you can turn it off. We taught people a simple self-hypnosis exercise. They, they imagine their bodies floating somewhere safe and comfortable, like a bath, a lake, a hot tub, or just floating in space. They could imagine a part of their body that hurts 
was warmer or cooler or tingling. Just set up a competing sensation and you can literally reduce the pain. The patients in our groups learned a self-hypnosis exercise that allowed them to reduce their pain by 50% over the course of the year on the same and lower amounts of medication. So pain treatment uh, really works. I can show you perhaps another example of it. You can look straight ahead and look up to the top of your head all the way up. Close your eyes slowly, take a deep breath. Breath out, eyes relax, body float. Try and get the sense of your whole body floating down, floating into your chair. And then imagine that you're floating somewhere safe and comfortable. A bath, a lake, a hot tub, a pool, or just floating in space. Each breath deeper and easier as you let your body shift into this state of floating lightness. And imagine that as you're floating, a blanket of tingling numbness, it might be warm if that feels good to you, or it might be cool, surrounds your body and penetrates deeper and deeper. So that you notice in different parts of your body the sense of pleasant, warm, or cool tingling numbness. And particularly in parts of your body where there's some discomfort, you surround that area with a sense of warm or cool tingling numbness. And let it become a kind of filter between you and the pain to filter the hurt out of the pain. Each breath deeper and easier. So that you notice how many different sensations you can feel in your body. The floating, the tingling, the warmth or coolness, the lightness and how you can choose to make a filter between you and the pain. Put distance between you and the pain to filter the hurt out of the pain. Each breath deeper and easier. You should allow your body to slip into this safe, comfortable, pleasant place. Now, when you're ready, as your body is floating safe and comfortable, picture in your mind's eye an imaginary screen. First, somewhere you just enjoy being. And then divide the screen in half. No matter what you see on the screen, keep your body floating. And picture on the left something you do that you've had to give up or you may have to give up. And then on the right side of the screen, picture something you want to be. that you're moving towards. Whatever you see on the screen, just keep your body floating, safe and comfortable. Take a few moments to reflect on what this means to you in a private sense, and then when you're ready, bring yourself out of this state of self-hypnosis by counting backwards from three to one. Now three, get ready, two with your eyelids closed, roll up your eyes, one, let your eyes That gives you a feeling for what we do in the group every week, and it's simple, it's a simple exercise. They learn to do it on their own. As I said, by the end of the year, our treatment patients had half the pain the control group did. So it's not hard, it's not fancy, it's not weird. 
It's just a way of refocusing your attention and taking more control over what's going on in your body. People have the idea that hypnosis is a way of taking away control. It's actually a way of giving people control over how their body's responding. We have evidence that they're changing sensory processing in the brain, that they're actually not just changing how they feel about the pain, they're actually changing how much pain they feel. They're changing the way their brain responds to input. So what are some of the other results of what we get in this program? Uh, he's saying, do you remember what you were feeling before you ate the other members of the group? This is a rare side effect. In general, uh, uh, people do quite well, and we found that we reduce stress symptoms, we reduce the uh, uh, ruminations and anxiety that comes with having cancer, and that the improvement is greater in the intervention group than the randomized control group. So despite the fact that they're facing dying and death, they're seeing people die in the group, they are less anxious and depressed rather than more anxious and depressed. Well, what's going on in people's bodies when this happens uh, in the group? Uh, Lucy uh, drops the ball and says, my body just doesn't seem to want to do what my brain tells it to. And Charlie Brown says, I can understand that my body and my brain haven't spoken to each other in years. And that's the way it's kind of been in medicine. You know, we've paid very little attention to the effects of the mind on the body. We were very surprised when we discovered, after some of these early groups that we did, what we did was we, we put patients through the supportive expressive experience. We found that they were less anxious and depressed. And then I got the idea in the mid-'80s of following up on what had happened to them medically, frankly, because I was so irritated at the wish away your cancer stuff that was going on. You know, picture white cells killing cancer cells was supposed to cure cancer. So we got death certificates from the women who were in the study. And we found that by four years after the study had begun, all of the control patients had died, but a third of the treatment group were still alive. And it turned out, much to our surprise, that there was an average 18-month survival advantage for women who had been in the support groups, randomized design, which was a real shock to us. So we published that in The Lancet then. Uh, we are now in year 12 of a follow-up study, and we don't yet know about the treatment control difference. I'm glad to say that, in general, the breast cancer patients are living longer than in the earlier study. It's the red line here. But we're waiting until we're absolutely certain what the final outcome is before we analyze the data from that study. To date, there have been 10 randomized trials testing the idea that providing emotional support affects cancer progression. Five of them show an effect, which is pretty surprising. Uh, our study uh, was the first published randomized trial, and there are now four others that show that providing emotional support extends survival time for cancer. However, there are five other randomized trials that show no difference. In two of these trials, there was a good emotional benefit, this one and this one, uh, but no survival benefit. In three others, there was no emotional benefit, so it's less surprising that there would be no survival advantage. Five of these studies showed no survival benefit. I'm glad to say that there are no studies that show that psychotherapy kills patients. There were no studies that showed shorter survival. So the studies themselves are not random. Half of them show an effect, half show no difference. None of them show a worse outcome. So while it doesn't prove the answer absolutely, it at least raises a serious question about whether providing good emotional support may have an effect on the rate of disease progression. Remember also, these are all patients in active medical treatment. So this isn't in place of medical care. This is in combination with good medical care. Um, it's less surprising when you realize that good social integration is good for your health. This is an overview of studies looking at the relationship between social isolation and mortality. It was published in the journal Science uh, in 1988. And what it shows is that if you're low in social integration, you have a twofold elevated risk of dying. Social isolation is as bad for your health as having high serum cholesterol levels or smoking, but we tend to pay very little attention to it. And what we're trying to do is repair the social isolation that can happen to many cancer patients. It might interest you to know that the kind of social connection that's good for your health if you're a man is being married. If you're a woman, it's not being married. It's relationships with other women, as you might have guessed. Um, so it leads me to the unhappy conclusion that having a relationship with a man does your health no good at all, regardless of your own gender. And uh, having a relationship with a woman does your health a great deal of good, regardless of your own gender. So social isolation uh, is a factor in health outcome and cancer health outcome as well. And so it's, it's less surprising that providing good social support in groups might have benefit. 
Well, finally, before I take time for questions, I want to take a few minutes to talk about what we think is going on in the body. And <clears throat> there are three possible explanations for how it is that good social support might affect disease progression. One is improved patient self-care and health behavior, you know, what I call the grandmother effect, doing all the things your grandmother tells you to. Eat well, sleep well, get plenty of exercise. Um, it's possible that people who get good emotional support take better care of themselves in general. Uh, it's possible that it involves improved compliance with medical treatment. Um, although in two of the studies that showed a survival benefit, one of them was ours, we actually looked to see whether there were differences in the health care they received, and the answer was there were no differences that could account for the survival difference. So I don't think it's just getting more medical treatment. So the third possibility is that there are biological pathways that can affect disease progression. And we published one model of this in Brain Behavior and Immunity last fall, and I'll show you the diagram in a little more detail. What it, the model suggests that psychosocial social factors like stress, social relationships, and support may affect stress response systems, like the hormone system um, uh, that helps us respond to stresses or the autonomic nervous system, that they can affect our circadian cycles of sleep and wakefulness. Uh, and these can affect both immune defenses and also tumor progression directly. And I'll show you the data that we have to date on this model. Well, the way we handle stress depends a lot on how we perceive it. This fish thinks the world is just. He thinks there's some justice in the world. He thinks there's no justice. And I leave it to you to decide which country is represented by which fish uh, here. Um, um, we have a stress response. We have a number of stress response systems, but the one I'm going to focus on is a hormone system uh, that secretes cortisol. Cortisol is the archetypal, archetypal stress hormone. It mobilizes glucose into the blood. It tells cells to release glucose so you're ready to fight or flee. Uh, it's also immunosuppressive, uh, and it is part of a very tightly regulated system. So the brain tells the hypothalamus to secrete a hormone that goes to the anterior pituitary, which secretes another hormone, ACTH, that tells the cortex pump out time to pump out cortisol. But as soon as the cortisol levels start to go up, they inhibit more production of these stress hormone mediators. So the system is designed to turn itself on when you need it, when you see that saber-toothed tiger, uh, and turn it off when the emergency is over so you don't deplete energy reserves in the body. Um, and so this is modeled like this. With stress, it goes up, but then it shuts itself off, and you're back to baseline. That's a good, well-functioning stress response system. However, there's been an observation that repeated stressors can sometimes dysregulate this system so that it doesn't turn itself off when it should. It's been called allostatic load, the cumulative effect of stressors on physiological response systems. Repeated stress response activation has been associated with dysregulation of this system and adverse health consequences. And what happens, it's sort of like breaking a light switch by using it too much. You turn it on and off all the time. The system sometimes gets stuck in the on position or gets burned out and stuck in the off position. And that has adverse health consequences. Um, here's some illustrations of this. This is a normal diurnal cord pattern, a pattern of cortisol throughout the day. As you know from this morning, waking up is a daily stress task. And in fact, your cortisol levels are four times as high in the morning as they should be by the time you go to sleep at night. So your levels should be pretty low now, I can tell you mine are. Um, people who are depressed tend to have systems that are stuck in the on position. Their cortisol levels tend to be high all the time. And people who are uh, have post-traumatic stress disorder tend to have burned out systems that are low all the time. But in both cases, they've lost this nice diurnal variation you see here. So some of the common stress-related problems that I talked about at the beginning related to cancer are accompanied by abnormalities in this hormonal stress response system. And we studied that in relationship to the cancer itself. We found that only about a third of our metastatic breast cancer patient sample had normal cortisol patterns. Two-thirds had abnormal patterns. Some, in some cases, they actually went up later in the day rather than going down. We're able to measure cortisol and saliva now. You can reliably measure it so we didn't have to keep sticking people, which is a stressor in and of itself. They would just spit into little tubes and save them, and we'd collect them and analyze them. Cortisol levels went up rather than down. And when we looked at what happened to these women, we found that the women with the relatively abnormal patterns subsequently died sooner 
than women with the normal cortisol pattern. So it was actually an independent physiological predictor of shorter survival. And it was independent of all the usual factors that, that can, we use to predict mortality, estrogen, recept, progesterone receptor status, degree of metastatic spread, and so on. So it's an independent.